Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of cloud computing. Today, my guest is from Puppet Labs. We have Luke Canies. He's the CEO and co-founder of the company. So welcome to the show, Luke. Thank you very much, Rich. Glad to be here. You bet. You know, we're, we're both in Portland and the sun is shining, so uh, it, it's a good day to be in Portland. But uh, I brought your slides up. Why don't we start with that? Okay, great. Uh, so first I want to talk a little bit about Puppet Labs. So we've been around since 2005. I, as you mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of the company. Um, we produced our first open source release uh, pretty quickly after the company was founded. And since then, I've been basically growing in community, growing in adoption, growing in users. Um, now, you know, it's, it's always hard to judge how big a community actually is in open source, but based on what we can tell, you know, we've, we've got thousands of people who are actively participating in our community, and we figure 10 to, you know, at least 10,000 people who are using the product worldwide. Um, and we've got multiple deployments out there that are at least 50,000 machines managed by Puppet in one organization, um, and, you know, just really millions of nodes managed in, in various size infrastructures all around the world. We produced our first commercial product in, in uh, just in, I guess it's no longer 2011, is it? Um, so I have to say last year. Uh, and in the, the year or so that it's been out, we've seen really great adoption of that product. And now it's, um, you know, it's a major source of our revenue. It's the major source of our revenue. And we, we've seen great reception, reception from our, our customers and our users in that product. Um, and we are a venture-backed company. And we just closed our third round of funding late last year. Uh, was a, another round led by Kleiner with um, VMware, Cisco, and Google Ventures all participating in the round. So that, uh, they're going to be great partners going forward for the next couple of years, and uh, I think we've got a great path ahead of us with, with those companies, and uh, you know, obviously we have plenty of, plenty of room to grow and to move. So very excited about that. So what we're trying to do with Puppet, what, the reason why Puppet exists is to help you automate your infrastructure. But one of the things that really differentiates Puppet is we're not trying to automate people out of jobs. We're trying to make the people who are doing the work of managing systems, of building systems, of maintaining systems, we're trying to make them more powerful. So it's not about automating, you know, it's, it's not about, you know, you've got all these lever pullers out there and we're trying to, you know, help companies replace the lever pullers in the organization. It's really about taking the sysadmins who are really the experts in the company, right? You are hired for your technical expertise. You're hired for your ability to solve problems. You're hired for your what you understand about the system, and automate the menial parts of their job. Automate the things that are that they are not particularly, not not that they're not good at them, but that they aren't adding the most amount of value. Your ability to compile an application isn't why you're worth a hundred thousand dollars a year to your organization. Your ability to you know, SCP a package around isn't what's special. Your ability to look at the infrastructure, understand what needs to be done, and act quickly based on that. That's what makes you special. So Puppet is really about automating the menial parts of your job, the annoying the parts, the parts where, you, where no human can add much value, and, get, and allowing people to spend the majority of their lives, the majority of their times in areas where humans are especially good at them. Um, so we really think about it being more about creating Iron Man, you know, turning you into this ultra-powerful, more powerful human than about creating this kind of automaton robot. And so far, Puppet's been doing very well. We've got Puppet users not just all around the world, but really in all kinds of companies. Um, you know, we, we, and, and even we, we don't list it on here, but we've even, we're seeing kind of very mainstream adopters like insurance companies. So we really have got um, a lot of different kinds of companies, a lot of different sizes of companies. I, I've seen Puppet installations as small as two machines where people are happily getting real value from Puppet. And when people buy our product, you can use our commercial product for up to 10 nodes for free. But we see companies actually buy eight licenses from us because they find real value in managing in that small an infrastructure. Um, and in terms of why Puppet exists, it's frustrating. So I was a sysadmin for a very long time. And the challenges that people face in infrastructure today aren't dramatically different than they were when I first started doing the work, I, I guess, 15 years ago now. Um, you really have to be looking about you know, how do we get more done and how do we do it with less money, right? Because even if your budgets aren't shrinking, your infrastructure is growing, right? You're, today you're having to be uh, – when I first started, you could take machines down on the weekend. You had maintenance windows. You could take 
three days to upgrade an application. You could start on Friday night, and as long as it was done by Monday morning, everything was okay. That's all changed, right? You can't do that anymore. You now have to get far more done in far less time with far less downtime and preferably with less cost. Um, and you no longer can get away with just doing what the geeks are really being able to respond to business needs. And, really, really, and, and then this is a lot of what DevOps is about. It's about saying it's not just enough to be a great sysad, and you have to really do what the organization needs you to do. Um, and this is one of the big challenges, is how do we get the technology into the organization as quickly as we need? How do we get you know, software deployments to, to be done with less friction with uh, you know, just kind of overall moving much, much faster? Um, and the lack of visibility is definitely a major concern too, where when people are, if you're an application owner, you want to know not just what version I'm running right now, but you know, when are we going to be able to do the next upgrade? When we're doing an upgrade, how is it going? How is it working? What's actually happening right now? If there was an outage, why was there an outage? Um, you kind of you want this visibility, and in most organizations, there is a. Uh, I was it was called by Lee Thompson at one point the wall of confusion between the application people and the operations people. And you want to be able to get rid of that wall. You want to have much better collaboration, um, and then you want to have control over your infrastructure. You don't want to have random drift from one machine to the next. You don't want to have you know your London data center and your Atlanta data center be fundamentally different, not because they have fundamentally different needs. But just what often happens is they're just in different places and maintained by different people, and therefore they end up built differently for no real reason. So Puppet is really about helping to fix those things. Um, and the reason why Puppet exists is that the, the actual current state of IT automation in terms of trying to solve those problems is uh, – I've used a lot of pejorative terms to describe this over time, but um, the, the one that I keep coming back to is, is embarrassing, really. Um, the vast majority of organizations out there are not doing any kind of automation at all. They're still doing manual configurations. And really, a lot of them, and I don't know how you do this anymore since most of machines don't even come with CD-ROMs anymore, are using physical media to install computers. And, and then they're manually configuring them from there. And the ones that aren't using physical media anymore, they're all using golden images. And these golden images, you know, they don't really, we, we call them golden images, but fundamentally they're really much more like foil balls. They're, they're, they're this complicated wrapped up thing that when you have to upgrade it, it's extremely complicated to do. We had one customer, before they started using Puppet, they were using golden images as their management style, and they found that they actually couldn't even deploy software for six months because the golden image management process was so complicated that they essentially they, they couldn't do software deployment. It was very painful. Um, and then there are, there are these very large, very expensive, very complicated software packages that, in general, you wouldn't even their sales guys wouldn't even take your call unless it's worth at least a half million dollars to them, which means that it doesn't work for those people we were talking about who have only two machines or who have ten machines or even who have a hundred machines to manage. They're not going to bother talking to you. And even if they did talk to you, you couldn't afford it. And even if you could afford it, it wouldn't solve your problem anyway. So what ends up happening in most cases is people are doing some combination of manual configuration and custom shell scripts and Perl scripts and things like that. And so in the vast majority of cases when Puppet comes into an organization, that's what we're replacing is these tools that some sysadmin created a very long time ago, and they've been kind of hand maintaining over time. So this led us to create Puppet. And I, 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 you know, when I first started Puppet, I was a sysadmin. I had been doing automation with the tools out there. I'd been um, initially doing the work myself and then realized that uh, I, I could kind of help multiple organizations do this. So I spent a couple years doing consulting. Um, and that led me to, you know, the, the frustration with those tools led me to create Puppet. And, and our goal really was to make it so that you could, you know, you could go from what, what at the time and, and today, you know, 20 to 30 machines managed by a given sysadmin is considered kind of best practice. And we've seen, you know, we've got one Puppet customer who their target for number of machines managed by a sysadmin is 10,000. Um, we've seen another customer who they were able to do a direct comparison of, the, a group that was using Puppet and a group that was using a, a comparable commercial tool. And the difference there was the Puppet users were managing 12 times as many machines as the, uh, the other users. Um, but not just about productivity, not just about being able to do more. It's also about being much, much faster. Um, uh, a large government organization was able to reduce the amount of time it takes to get a machine into production from three months to three weeks. They had this very complicated uh, compliance process and they were able to automate the vast majority of that compliance process with Puppet. Um, and then 
in terms of configuration drift, you know, you're using Puppet to manage your entire infrastructure. And so you know if you've got configuration variation, you, it's there on purpose. It's there because it's needed for the organization. And visibility in, in Puppet is fantastic. You know exactly what's happening. You know why it's happening. You know how it's happening. And you can see every change that happens in your whole. So as an example of where Puppet has made a, a large difference for an organization, Zynga is a great place to look. Uh, Zynga has grown faster than any company could reasonably have grown even five years ago. If you had called up Dell in 2005 and said, hi, I need you to ship me 1,000 machines a week, and I need to have those machines every Monday morning at 9 a.m. I need to have them rack stacked, installed, ready to go, fully functioning, Dell would have laughed and said, there's no way we can do that. But this is exactly what Zynga was able to do using Amazon DC2. And with Puppet, they were not only able to launch 1,000 machines a week, but they were actually able to get them completely configured in an entirely hands-off way. You just you, you hit go, and EC2 gets the machine up and running, and then Puppet makes that machine actually functioning in the infrastructure. Um, and that kind of growth is available today with a lot of technologies out there, but there are no, there's no number of humans you can hire that could configure 1,000 machines a week. So even if you, Dell could have gotten you, gotten you the 1,000 machines, you would have needed an army of people to maintain them without Puppet to configure them all for you. So uh, that, to me, this is just a great example of, of how much of a difference Puppet can make for organizations like this. And, and Zynga, you know, for those of you who don't know Zynga, they're the people behind Mafia Wars and Farmville, and they're, they're in, you know, they just went public a few weeks ago, and their infrastructure growth, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody's gone through the kind of growth that they have in terms of number of users, number of, you know, maybe not number of users, but the, from zero to as big as they are in just a couple of years is fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about how Puppet works. So the first thing you do is you define how you want your infrastructure to, to, to work. And in Puppet, that definition is, goes through a very simple configuration language. Um, so you specify what you want to manage and how those things relate to each other. The second is you can run the, that configuration in a simulation mode to see what would happen if I run this configuration. Um, and this will tell you things like, well, we need to install this package or create this user or edit this file in some way. And then once you're satisfied that what it's going to do is what you actually want to have happen, you run it in, in what we call enforcement mode where it actually modifies your system in some way and you get a report saying, this is what happened. And then you can look at that report and see that these are the changes that are happening to your infrastructure over time. And those reports are all centralized so you can see not just what's happening to one machine, but what's happening to all of your machines at once. Um, and one of the great things about Puppet is this whole process runs, by default, it runs every half an hour on every machine in your infrastructure so that it's not just a question of one time making sure your machine is configured, but getting your machine configured correctly in the first place and then keeping it configured for the entire lifetime of that, of that uh, either physical or virtual machine. Um, in terms of the definition phase itself, Puppet has what we call a resource, and these resources are they, they map to the, the kind of the fundamental elements of your machine. So these are the users you have to create, the packages you have to install, the services you have to run, the files you have to have in place. These are all the things that you have to edit. And you don't have to care how that works. You don't have to care how packages work. You don't have to care how services work. You just have to care, hey, I want this capability. I want a web service installed. I want a web service to be running. And Puppet translates this web server package or this web service into the bits on disk that need to actually happen. And so the, the user can focus on the work that needs to be done. It can focus on the problem they're trying to solve and not the details of how to solve it on Red Hat or on SUSE or on Solaris or AIX or you know, whatever the details are. Um, so looking a little bit more at the, what it means to, to build a, a public configuration, it's primarily composed of what we call resources, which are the files, the packages, the users, the groups, all the, the, the low-level things that you're managing on a host. And one of the keys to Puppet is that when you're talking about a package or a service, you don't have to care how that package is built, how that package is installed. If you're running on Red Hat or Solaris or Debian, then they all look the same to you. You just say, I would like this package installed, or I'd like this service running. And Puppet translates that high-level idea into the low-level bits that need to change on disk. Um, and very similarly, you, you get a lot of that. You, you, you can get a lot of portability across. If you build what it, you know, this is my web service. You can build a web service configuration that works great on, you know, your production Polaris machines in London and on your development Red Hat machines in Atlanta, and you can get that kind of portability across both those systems very, very easily. So here's an example of a small snippet of Puppet code that manages 
SSH, which is a, a secure shell daemon that most sysadmins will recognize and, and, and use all over the place. This is what it takes to get that machine, get that service installed, configured, and up and running and being maintained over time so that you know that it's always running, you know it's always there. And you can see this is very, very simple stuff. You can take this code and you can put it in front of really any user and they'll go, yeah, I, I know what that's doing. It, it's got a package there. It's got a service. It's got a file. This is how it's configured. It's pretty straightforward. We've got one user who takes their puppet code and actually passes it off to their auditors, and that's one of the ways that they they pass their audit is that the auditors can understand their puppet code, and so they can be confident that, hey, if your puppet code says you're doing this, then we know you're in compliance as long as, you know, as long as the, the code itself is in compliance. Um, so I want to talk a little about Puppet Enterprise. This is our, we, we just released two months ago our, our second major upgrade to, to Puppet Enterprise, and there was a lot of new functionality released in this upgrade. And I'm going to go through it all very, uh, very briefly. So first is our graphical interface. And um, in general, Puppet itself, the, the open source Puppet, is very command line driven. And this works great with our audience because we, we are primarily used by sysadmins, and sysadmins are command line people. But it turns out there are a lot of things that, that are just you know, much better in a graphical tool. And you know, reporting is a great example of that. Looking at ASCII art images is not the greatest productivity tool out there in the world. Um, so here's an example of what your kind of core management interface looks like in Puppet. You can see that you get a list of all the machines you're managing. You get a list of all the, the resources that are being managed in those machines. You've got 38 hosts here. Most of them don't see any changes. Some of them are seeing some changes. Um, you've got some failed, failed resources on, the ho on, on your host. And you know how many resources you're managing across the whole, the whole system. And in some cases, you've got very few resources you're managing, maybe you know, very few packages or files. But in some cases, you've got thousands of machines that you're managing, uh, thousands of resources that you're managing on a given machine. Um, and then uh, cloud provisioning is a, our cloud provisioning tool is another one well, of the, the key capabilities in Puppet Enterprise. And that basically gives you the ability to take an existing configuration, take your web service or your database service, and start a new image with that configuration. And it doesn't just bring up the image, but it brings it up, gets Puppet installed on it, and then Puppet configures that machine to be exactly the service that you wanted to run uh, on, on that image. So it's essentially one command to go from, you know, to, to build a whole new image and get it, get it working appropriately. Um, the third piece is orchestration, where what you're basically doing is you're doing dynamic query across your, across your machines to say, okay, I want to find all of, my, all of my Solaris boxes and restart my web server. So I want to find all of my, all the machines running MySQL and upgrade because there's security vulnerability. Uh, something like that where you, you want to do a, run a quick command across a, a pool of machines and so it's about real-time discovery of what's actually running, what's there, what, is, what does the machine look like right now, and then perform an action across all those machines at once. And the last is compliance. And compliance essentially allows you to take, take a snapshot of, your, of the configurations of your, on your infrastructure and, and track changes of those, those, change, those configurations over time. So you want to see people are upgrading packages, they're adding users, they're changing people's passwords, they're editing files. You can watch these changes as they're made in your infrastructure. And one of the things, obviously, this gives you is you know what's happening on your machine. You know how your configurations are changing over time. And this is a great tool for people who have not yet begun to build automation. Or maybe they have automation in a subset of their infrastructure, but they're, they're not yet at the point where they can, they can propagate that automation to the whole place. And what this tells you first is where it makes the most sense to automate, because you can look at what's changing the most often, what's changing the most quickly, and then as a result you can see where it makes sense to automate, where it makes sense to, to invest the time in building a tool here versus, you know, this changes so rarely that when we have to do it manually it might be worth just continuing to do it manually for a little while. Um, now, this is what we just announced, and we're very proud of this release, but obviously we're not going to sit, sit on our laurels and do nothing for the next year. 2012 is going to be a, a very big year for us. First, we've got a lot of work to do with our, our new partners that we just announced in our funding round, uh, Amazon, Google, and VMware. And then, uh, sorry, Cisco, Google, and VMware. And then Amazon just just added Puppet to their Linux AMI. So it's become a lot easier for Amazon users to use Puppet. 
Um, and we've been doing some work with them on their CloudFormation product and things like that. And Puppet has always been a critical part of the OpenStack community. Um, Rackspace has always been a big Puppet user, and the, the vast majority of the OpenStack work done out there is done with Puppet. Uh, so, th so we've got a lot of work to do there. And one of the very interesting efforts we've had in the last six months or so is being a very design-focused company. And it's a little bit strange to be in infrastructure but be focused on design because people think of design as being about graphical interfaces and shininess rather than usability, simplicity, um, and, and suitability to the task. And for us, design in this, on the command line interface is just as important as design in the graphical interface. Design of our APIs and of our, of our uh, configuration language, those are all very, very critical to us. And uh, the, the third major area that we'll, we'll be looking at in 2012 is data. So Puppet knows more about your infrastructure than really any other tool out there. It knows all the resources you're managing, all the hosts you're managing, all the dependencies between those resources, every change that's ever happened to any of those resources. Um, and what we'll be doing in 2012 is really building tools to get even more value out of those. So we showed you some of what you can get from that data today. But there's so much additional value that that, that, that data has and what we'll be doing is building applications to help you extract more of that. And DevOps is the last major thing we'll be spending a lot of time on. Um, at the beginning of 2011, I, I think most people I talked to really hadn't heard of DevOps, but hadn't really become a major force. And we, we, we attended conferences all over the world where the, the focus was DevOps, but we also attended a, a lot of conferences where they were general operations conferences or general technology conferences, and DevOps was a major focus in those, in those conferences too. So it really has become a big force in operations, and Puppet is a big part of that. So we'll be spending a lot more time on that, too. And I think that's it for our presentation. So if you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask. Okay, Luke, thank, thank, thanks for that. You know, I'm curious, when, when you do these rounds of funding, right, they say that, uh, you know, when you get venture money, it's, it's like getting a life partner, right? They're, they're, they're right next to you all the time. Are they helping you to decide where to go on that last slide, the what's in store? Are they, are they driving you towards certain areas, or is it more organic than that? So I completely agree that investors, your investors are your partners, or your investors better be your partners. Um, I haven't been divorced, and I haven't lost an investor, so I can't say whether this is true or not, but they say that it's easier to get divorced than it is to lose an investor. Um, I, th I think that's a good way of thinking about it, and it's far more important that you have a great investor than that you have the right amount of money. Uh, it's much easier to get more money or to survive with less money than it is to survive a bad investor or a bad relationship with a good investor. So we got very lucky in that our first investor is a, is a, is a fantastic firm that, that's True Ventures, um, and all of our investors since then have been great. Radar partner, Kevin Compton, Radar Partners has been you know, an amazing partner. Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins has been a great partner. And it was really, really important to us when we got these new investors that they not just be somebody who's showing up and giving us money and we can put the name on a slide, but that somebody who we really want to work with. And this is why, you know, Google Ventures, right? Google is, is an amazing company in many, many ways. But one of the reasons that they're a great partner for us, you know, for one, obviously, they're one of the largest puppet sites out there. And in fact, the, the guy who built the Puppet infrastructure at Google is now the product manager for Puppet at Puppet Labs. So they know Puppet really, really well. But they also know operations really well. They know DevOps really well because they have some of the, the best sysadmins out there, and they've always had a very strong focus on operations. So when you want to go talk to somebody about the value of operations, there are, there are not, many good, not, not better examples out there than Google if we'd want to talk to. Um, VMware is a fantastic partner for us because they have the same users, they have the same audience, they have the same problem set that we have, and Puppet helps make VMware more, more valuable. Right? If you're using Puppet plus VMware, then it's, you, know, you, you can easily and cheaply install just that many more instances of, of virtual machines. You can manage more vir vir virtual machines, and so they're a great partner for us there. And, and Cisco, they understand infrastructure, they understand management, they understand operations. Again, they're more of a network focus, but it, they're in IT you know, really more than anybody else out there. So the partner is absolutely critical, and all these companies are very, very forward-looking, and they're all a critical part of deciding what we're going to be doing in 2012 and 2013. But the thing that's also really, really important about venture partners is that you can't let them control things. You can't let them run things. So these partners are all critical for us, 
oh, we are deciding what we're doing. We're, we're treating them as great sources of information, great sources of ideas, great sounding boards about talking about those ideas, but we are still running the company. We are deciding what makes the most sense for our users, for our customers, and for our community. So it, it is an important balance. So, Luke, you know, one of the things they tell me in the startup communities is that growth is the hardest thing you can do well, right? And and you coming in, that you are a technologist. What what are the challenges for you as, as the company grows and gets this kind of new level of funding, um, you know, to, to take the company forward? What what are the tough nuts for you there? Growth is amazingly difficult. Um, for a long time, so I, I've been running this company for almost seven years now. And for almost four years of that time, it was just me at the company. Um, or three years, it was just me. And the next year, it was me and two other people. And then we began growing like crazy. And for the first three to four years, I thought being a startup was what was different, what was special. And then I realized that it's not really about being a startup. It's about being at a growth company. And growth, the, the, the crazy thing about growth is that if you feel like you understand your job, you're doing it wrong. Your job is going to change so quickly so dramatically and so fundamentally so often that if you ever feel like you know what you're doing, you've, been not, you've not been paying attention. And so, yeah, it, it, is, it is very complicated. Um, there was this one time of the 60 people where I hired somebody into a role that I already understood when I hired them, but the other 59 people, I've had, essentially I'm constantly hiring people where I go, so I, we, we have a problem, and I don't really know how to describe the problem or how we would solve it, but apparently somebody says you might be good at this or something, and you kind of have to define the role and find a person and get comfortable that they can solve it without you really knowing what the problem is very well. This is, this is very difficult. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I know people get bored easily. One of the things you do not do in a growth company is get bored. So uh, there's a great quote by uh, Greg Lamond that it never gets easier, you just go faster, right? There's no point at which you can get comfortable, but you can get a lot more done. That's great. So, you know, Luke, uh, this past summer we had the OzCon conference here in Portland, of course, and um, you guys had a reception at your facility, and I remember it was just a mob scene. <laughs> And, I, you know, I mean, this is Portland. There's plenty of things for these people to go do and other events. What do you think, what do you attribute to that, that, uh, that, that huge crowd that came to see you guys? Yeah, we had about 750 people come through our event that night, and that's about half the total attendees of OzCon. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a number of things. One is that Puppet is a great open source project, and we have a great reputation, and so people really wanted to come and see what, what the company was like, what our space was like. We've got a really fantastic office, and uh, I think people wanted to see what that was like. You know, I, I don't think it was all of it, but people might have been interested in uh, the great beer and great cocktails we were serving at the time. Um, but just overall, it's, we have such not just a, a large community, but a positive community. And there's so much – I mean, it's very strange, right? I had a manager one time at one of our customers say that – he didn't know what to do because for the first time in his entire career as a technical manager, his sysadmins were all happy. And there's this real emotional fondness that people have for Puppet because it's made their lives so much better. You know, we, we have uh, one of our guys, one of our community members, um, has always said that the thing you love about Puppet is it gets into the pub by five. And you, it, kind of, it gives you your life back as a sysadmin, right? And when it does that, then you look at the product differently. And... And I think that the people who were coming to our offices at OzCon, they, they saw that and they wanted to see what it was about. They wanted to see what we're doing that causes this kind of behavior in, in the paranoid uh, sysadmins who tend to, you know, sit in the basements and grumble about things. <laughs> well, great. Well, hey, Luke Canies, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. All right. Thank you, Rich. Glad to be here. All right, folks. That's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on the world.